What's up everyone, today I'm going to explain one very core concept in cryptocurrency which is the blockchain and this applies to both Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dash, almost every single cryptocurrency that's based on crypto. Um, Bitcoin. So I'm going to use some worked examples to cover this. At the end of this, you're going to figure out what you know transactions fees are. You're going to figure out why block sizes matter, and it's going to answer you so many of your questions about cryptocurrency. And this is such an important topic that I really want to cover properly. So that's a blockchain, and I'm definitely going to use lots of cool art to try to cover this. So let's start with something very basic. Let's say, for example, we have a person called Alice, and she has one Bitcoin. All right, mine my, my really bad art but she has one bitcoin and she wants to send that to bob all right something that def definitely i think a lot of you have done before you probably have sent bitcoins either using your exodus wallet your paper wallet your ledger nano s wallet whatever the case alice has you know she wants to send this one bitcoin to bob and she wants to announce it so what happens when she does this transaction well she you need to figure out first of all that she has money in her wallet okay that's great and then um, she wants to do a transfer. She has an address for Bob. Then she's going to send that off. And when she sends it off, she's going to sign it with a digital signature. That's kind of using your private key, your password, or whatever, or whatever that's out there. Sorry for the simplifications. She's going to sign it. And the beauty of mathematics is that we can actually verify the signature. So the network, it gets broadcast to the network. The network accepts it. And now she can broadcast it to anyone. That's right. That's how peer-to-peer -peer works. You can broadcast this message to essentially anyone that's running a Bitcoin client or anything really out there that's running this. So that's the beauty of it. And that's why Bitcoin can't be censored because you can broadcast to anyone on this network, whether they're in China, whether they're in America, anyone, as long as they can receive that small transaction information, just kilobytes of information, they can now broadcast that to the entire world. So that's what nodes are. Nodes are like the FedEx, the delivery vehicle for transactions on the Bitcoin network. So she broadcasts that and gets in goes to a node. And a node holds a lot of information about the transactions are not processed. All right, now we'll talk about something that's important. We're going to talk about putting them into blocks. So she broadcasts this and it goes into something called a block. Well, what is a block? A block is just, well, a bunch of transactions. It's a bunch of ledgers of transactions. No matter what you want to call it, it just contains information such as this, just a bunch of information about various transactions that are happening on the network. And who creates these blocks? Well, the miners create their blocks. In fact, many times on my channel, I've been calling miners the accountants. Well, that's because they receive tons of this information. They bundle it all up into something called a block. And now it is verified. Now it's the, the code that is now going to be recorded in the history of Bitcoin. So once this block has been formed, now it goes back to the node. The node announces it to the, all the miners in the world, and they're going to update what they know as blockchain. So it's just going to add one. So once a block is formed, everyone says, oh, yeah. It's maths. We can check that out. That block looks legit. All right. Now it is now part of the blockchain. So everyone has the same copy of the blockchain. That is super amazing technology. And that is why there's so much interest in this technology right now. It's just an updated version. They just updated themselves with new transaction information plus one to that. And now it just forms a very long chain of blocks. And if you are, guys are wondering, it does go back to the first creation of Bitcoin. So the first Genesis block was there. And now we can just continue that block. All these, you know, all the mining, all the processing, processing of transactions all goes into this blockchain. So now that actually means some different uh, things. For example, if you download the full Bitcoin wallet, you're going to have to download gigabytes of data. That's all the transactions that's ever happened in the history of Bitcoin is actually kept there. And you know, some people have been asking, why don't we just dump the old transactions? Well, because Bitcoins works by having inputs and outputs, it calculates how much is in the wallet by all the trans um, Bitcoins it has received, subtracted by all the Bitcoins that sent out. So if you discard parts of the blockchain, it's never ever going to work again. And blockchains are permanent because it's a copy is kept on every single computer and it's all done by mathematical verification. It means that every copy of the blockchain is exactly the same. So if you try to alter, you know, history, alter the database, ain't going to happen because your blockchain is now different from everyone else. And everyone else can see that for the beauty of mathematics. So why do we need blocks in the first place? I mean, if Alice can just announce her transaction, very much like when you go to pay with your Visa card or whatnot, it just announces to a server. Well, it's because of bookkeeping. It's because Alice can do something shady. 
All right, let's assume, you know, Alice isn't a great person. Let's assume Alice might not be a great person. She has one Bitcoin. And what if she decides to send one Bitcoin to Bob and one Bitcoin to Charlie? And she announces it at the same time to different nodes. You know, she can do that. Maybe she sends part of the one message to DHL network, the other network to a message to the FedEx network. They all get trans translated and relayed across the network. And now she has two outgoing transactions, but she only has one Bitcoin. And that's the whole beauty of this ledger system. Because now these two transactions are technically unconfirmed, which is great. That's why when you send money to an exchange, it goes into unconfirmed status first. And then miners have to process it and to become confirmed. So in the kind of the accounting process, one of them are going to get ruled out. So this one or this one. So it's kind of like a race against time to see which transaction gets confirmed. So if there is ever double submitting, if Alice is kind of a douchebag and tries to spend it, then well, one of them, only one of them was gonna get processed by miners forming a block. And then only one of them is gonna incorporate into the blockchain. And then the other one is gonna become invalid because now she has zero Bitcoins. So that's kind of how this bookkeeping system works. And that's kind of why we need to wait for confirmations, sometimes three confirmations, six confirmations before you're ready to spend that money in your exchange. A little bit more on that letter, you know, why we need to wait for six confirmations. I think that's going to be covered in another video topic if you guys are interested in that. So moving on, um, blockchain. Okay, moving on to this. So transactions. You do know that Bitcoin transactions have a fee, for example, a $7 fee sometimes. So why is there such a big fee and why isn't this fee kind of permanent? In fact, if you're transferring one Bitcoin and 100 Bitcoins, you almost pay the same amount of fees. Well, that's because every f transaction has a certain size or maybe kilobytes of information. And you need to bundle it into a one megabyte block. This is for Bitcoin. So to pack Miners are motivated by greed. What they do is every time they form this kind of block, every time they form this, they get to keep all the fees. Right? So they want to maximize their kind of payouts. And by doing so, what they want to do is they kind of sort out all the transactions that are happening right now, sort them by the highest fee, and we'll process it like that. So we'll, they'll take the ones with the highest fees, list them out, and put them in the next block. And that's why fees with a higher transaction, um, oh, sorry, transactions with a higher fee will get processed before transactions with a lower fee because miners are motivated by greed. The accountants are motivated by greed. They want to process the ones with the biggest fee, the biggest tip that they can make the biggest profit. So that's why, you know, you have to attach a fee and that's why the fee is never the same. If the network's very congested, there's a tons of unconfirmed transactions here, then you're gonna have to outbid everyone else. You're gonna have to pay more. You're like, it's like kind of paying for Uber during a traffic jam. You know, you're gonna have to press that like five times or, or kind of eight times fee to get this um, transaction into the blockchain. So, but once in the in the blockchain, it's permanent. You no longer have to pay additional fees. It's gonna get you know moved along. More chains are gonna form after that, and the transaction is gonna be confirmed. I'm gonna to touch a little bit about how Ethereum works as well, because I just talked about you know various transactions and being including them into a block, right? Those are just pure transactions. Well, Ethereum is a little bit different. Ethereum is a little bit special. Think of Ethereum instead of having you know these. Um, as all just just databases, just records of accounts. Instead, Ethereum is kind of like a computer state. Everyone has is running the, exactly the same computer, and every block instead of containing instructions for transactions, it contains kind of different clicks, different mouse clicks on a computer. So it's like kind of we're all operating the same computer with one block and we're following the instructions in the block to change our computer so it matches the same so it's the same state as everyone else that's kind of a very very brief explanation of the ethereum virtual machine but that's kind of how it works so instead of just containing transactions this contains computer code that alters my state of the ethereum virtual machine and that's why everyone is kept at the same state it's such a beautiful way of looking at things and that's why ethereum is so powerful as well well every different currency kind of relies um, I see most cryptocurrencies based on um, based on Bitcoin 
or using blockchain technology is actually using some form of this method or whatnot. So that should explain tons of cryptocurrencies like things like Dash, like Ethereum, Ethereum Classic, you know, your Bitcoin. So that should explain a lot of them. There's also other cryptocurrencies that work a little bit differently and I'll cover them in the future. If you guys like this episode, if you guys are confused about this episode, do leave a comment below of what you want me to talk about or what is unclear in this video. I did take a lot of shortcuts. I definitely think, you know, this is a starting point for understanding cryptocurrencies. And I hope this, I hope that I managed to break it down in an easy to understand way for you guys. I make tons of videos about various cryptocurrencies, cryptocurrency news and tutorials. So do subscribe to my channel if you enjoyed this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. See you next time.